is Tina Ruggieri. I am the assistant curator at the Abrams Engel Institute for the Visual Arts, located at the University of Alabama at Birmingham's campus. I'm excited to be here today with artist Jarrett Key. Jarrett was born in 1990 in Seal, Alabama, and just recently graduated with their MFA in painting from Rhode Island School of Design. They also hold a BA from Brown University, graduating in 2013, and studied Chinese language and culture and opera in 2011 at the Shanghai Theater Academy in Shanghai. Their work integrates movement, song, and painting that grapples with their anxiety towards the state of their own freedom in the United States. Excavating the lost stories and objects from their family's oral history, situated in rural Alabama, they focus their journey to understanding freedom through three lenses, survival, transformation, and celebration. Their work seeks to critique historical conditions that are the seeds of contemporary social and economic issues in America while creating spaces that celebrate beauty, joy, and survival. Jarrett has been featured in exhibitions and residency at the New York University Tisch School of the Arts, La Mama Galleria, the Columbus Museum, Gallery 67, Museum of Contemporary African Diasporan Art, Spring Break Art Show, and has an upcoming exhibition at Steve Turner in LA. They are also a co-founder of Codified Art, a Brooklyn-based multidisciplinary artist collective. Jared, thank you so much for joining me today. <laughs> Thank you for this intro. You killed it. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. First, I really just want to ask, like, how have you been doing during quarantine and have you been making any work during this time? So I'm feeling really lucky because my family is healthy. My brother's healthy. My mom is healthy. My dad is healthy. Like, don't have a lot of horror stories about people getting sick from COVID. So I just feel, first of all, very blessed about that. Yeah. Um, and I'm in Providence, Rhode Island still. And when COVID first happened in March, I was wrapping up my last semester in grad school, mm -hmm. but they kicked us out of our studios, which is the only thing that you need in art school. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so we got kicked out of our studios, which makes sense because they wanted to control yeah. who was able to like be in the space and try to control um, spread of the disease or the virus. I ended up working in my friend's garage and outside for basically March until the beginning of June. Mm -hmm. So I was working outside making these cement paintings and really watching the seasons change too. Because yeah. in Providence in early March, it's still kind of cold. Like it was still 30, 40 degrees max, like high. Oh, wow. And so I'm like outside in my sweatshirt, <laughs> yeah. and my, my hoodie, and I'm making the paintings. So I really, I'm lucky. I got to make paintings basically pretty consistently all the way until June. And then I got back into my studio in July. Um, in, in Fletcher where I was finishing grad school and they gave us access again so that was amazing and now I'm sort of in this in-between moment where I'm not really making anything because I'm sort of looking for a new studio but mm -hmm. also just needed a, a small break you know so I gave myself like three weeks so August has been like my break month and then September well, grad will start school is off. intense so I can understand <laughs> needing a little bit of of a breather <laughs> Absolutely. And this is super intense, you know, yeah. wake up at 7.30, go to bed at 2.30 a.m., do yeah. it all over again. <laughs> Pretty much just painting and working as much as I can. That's awesome. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about how you became interested in art and when did you know you wanted to become an artist? So John and I growing, my brother John and I growing up were kids that always did like creative things. We were always, the first thing, my first art love was music. Yeah. And so in the first and second grade, you know, you start with recorder and then I really loved it. And so I was like, mom, I really want to play piano. There were people at my church that played piano. So we started playing piano really like on our church's piano. That's and amazing. then we eventually like got a keyboard. So I played piano growing up, but basically, um, I mean, rigorously all the way up into college, picked up flute, picked up theater, picked up dancing. And so really, when I graduated high school, I had been spending all my time doing performance art. There was just nothing else to do. <laughs> yeah. I had like, you know, I had like flirted with being an invasive cardiologist when I was a kid. <laughs> I don't know what fourth grader is like, I want to be an invasive cardiologist. But that's definitely, <laughs> that's definitely what I said. That's and, hilarious. <laughs> and then I got to college, um, was majoring in theater and music and producing and directing plays and, mm -hmm. you know, 
and graduated school thinking I was gonna move to New York and be a producer, be a theater director. Left Providence, went to New York and did that. Worked at the public theater for four years, did producing. Um, but when I basically moved to New York and I was directing all these plays and I was producing all this work outside of work, I realized that I needed something I could do for myself. Mm -hmm. So much about theater is negotiation, it's about collaboration. Mm -hmm. And that's what makes it possible, that's what makes it amazing. But, you know, I just needed the space for myself to think about my own values, to think about the things that were keeping me up at night. This was mm -hmm. in, and so around 2013, 2014, we know that Trayvon Martin was just mm -hmm. killed, that we understand that Black Lives Matter was in full throttle, mm -hmm. people were yelling, hands up, don't shoot, and I can't breathe in the streets. And I needed a space to think. I yeah. needed a space to mourn. I needed a space to um, to meditate. Mm -hmm. And so that's really why I started painting. I can't, so like, you know, I'm because I've always been an artist. Yeah. It was just like, what am I making? You know, today yeah. I'm, I'm working on this play. Yeah. Tomorrow I'm going to like work on this art song. The next day I'm going to like, you know, set this these eight counts for a movement choreography for, you know, another director. Mm -hmm. And then I started painting and that was the game changer. And once I started painting, I just have never stopped. Yeah. So I've been painting like basically every single day for eight years. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. But you were, I, you were just born creative, you know, and I say this almost in all my interviews that all artists are born with this inherent need to create and that you find a way to do it is what happens. And it, it can transform and morph into another type of artistic practice, but ultimately you're always creating. Absolutely. And I, you know, and, that's, and that's really what it feels like, you know, I don't, even when I'm on vacation, like when I go to New York and visit my brother for a week, mm -hmm. John is like, oh, like, are you good? Like, I was like, oh, I'm good, but I just need to like work on something. Can I just have a piece of paper? You know what I mean? It just is like, it is just so um, weird for me to not be creating something. Yeah. So I'm just happy that right now, you know, I'm a full-time artist mm -hmm. and I can just spend all my time thinking about this. Amazing. Um, and it's been really working out well for me. So I feel really blessed and lucky that you know, I really get to pursue my dream too. And, you know, and there's nothing else to do for me. Like I can't even imagine <laughs> doing anything. I, Cause that was some advice I got when I was younger, particularly before I really was diving into like, oh, am I gonna be an artist? Like, what does this look like? And someone once told me, you know, people who become artists are people who really cannot do anything else. Mm -hmm. And it's not because they don't have the skill set. It's exactly. not because they don't have the passion, but it's because when they wake up in the morning, they can only think about one thing. Yeah. And when I, you know, and I really was like, am I that person? Am I that person growing up? And then basically my second year in New York, it was solidified. I mm -hmm. woke up in the morning and knew like what I had to do. I have to make something. I have to think about these processes. I have to go to the art store. I have to look at the new paintings that someone did at a museum or a gallery. It just became such an important part of the way that I could breathe. Yeah, um, I understand. So, yeah. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, so I'm going to show the, um, the short video that you shared with us and then we'll Perfect. talk about this. YZ stumbles and climbs up the second pillar under the tresses of a petite pine before passing through the screen's white yelps. What's going on? X closely stirs as YZ enters their club. The hate fell into focus and X gasped, Grandmother! X had never seen the hate appear. Only the sky carries such a color, unless the key bearer, the head of the family, flies away. Mother! Oh, my baby! Imagine that 
sky as clear as can be. A sky with no fears or worries. A sky free. Oh, baby, you're from my sky. Feeling the sky. It's like a bee. Um, if you would give us a little insight into this opera that you're creating um, and and the title of it and and what your 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 um what the story is totally thank you for sharing so the okay. opera so i just graduated mfa painting program mm -hmm. but one of my final projects <laughs> was this opera and the opera itself became um, a really clear culmination of a lot of the things that i was working with throughout my sculpture practice, and my performance practice, and my painting practice. Mm -hmm. And it's funny because music and opera was really my first love. Like when I came to Brown University, I thought I was gonna be, you know, opera singer, like the opera singer from the South, the tenor from the South. <laughs> um, and I quickly realized that I did not want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I definitely love music and I love storytelling. Mm -hmm. And so really the opera itself was triggered, was was born because of all the other things I was doing. So I started out um, making garments at, uh, making like couture pleat tip mm -hmm. garments because I was so excited about what does it look like for black folks to be wearing these couture gowns that are very difficultly made, that are, um, that are consistent historically with positions of power, with royalty, um, and, and with strength and courage and beauty. And, and that was, and that became like the start. I was like, I need to make these garments. Yeah. You know, I, every, cause in my performances, I first started out doing hair paintings. That's like a big kind of hair, a performance practice for me. And I make everything in the frame. And so the, including the garment, the music, the dances, the painting, the set, everything. And so the opera becomes like a new way for me to do that. Mm -hmm. So the, it doesn't have a name yet, but basically the story right now is a two act opera that is basically thinking, the first act looks at the traditions um, and life of a very tight knit community in an imaginary rural Alabama. Mm -hmm. That's sort of the landscape. So, um, you know, the pine cone becomes really important. The specific flowers become really important. Like the landscape itself becomes really, really important to mm -hmm. the world. So the first act sort of establishes, you know, the matriarch dies and now this child becomes head of the family. Mm -hmm. And they have to run this family at 14. And, you know, the child realizes that there is so much that is right about the ways that the traditions work and with their family, but there's so much they want to change. So the first act is like, what is going on in this world? What are the traditions that are happening and, and what needs to change? And the second act is, you know, going and looking, facing your family, facing your traditions, helping the family progress and move forward mm -hmm. in this new vision, in this new world that's actually more inclusive of, of more people in the community. Yeah. And so that's kind of conceptually what's going on. Yeah. Um, but right now I'm basically, you know, right now I'm, I'm making this opera and I'm basically trying to figure out the story. It's very much in process. I'm almost done with the first act. Um, but right now I'm playing all the roles myself. Yeah. And so me changing, and so I'm working with the voices. I have a five octave range. So I'm like trying oh, wow. to give each character their own voice. So that's something I'm playing with too. Um, and yeah, and we'll see, we'll see what ends up happening. I think, you know, in a couple of years, it'll be a more full-fledged opera with like various characters that's yeah. like fully ready to be staged. But until then, I'm really doing this sort of almost um, mixtape to try to get the, try to figure out what the story is. So just based on what you told us about the story, is it the type of story that you hope to see in our society one day? Like yeah, absolutely. I feel, you know, I feel like, I feel like this story is so important because it's, 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 just, it's just about like how we live our lives. Like we are constantly trying to accept the things that we can't change and change the things that we can influence. You know what I mean? Yeah. And that's what this opera is about. But it's from the perspective of someone who is trying to learn mm -hmm. why things are the way that they are. Someone who is not stuck 
in the status quo, someone who really, you know, really wants to push the community to be even better, to be more inclusive, to be more progressive. Open to change for the better exactly. of everyone. Yeah. Exactly. And, you know, and I, like, and I think about Alabama, right? Yeah. Because Alabama is like, you know, it's known as a very conservative state, yeah. but we both know coming from Alabama that it has changed a lot. Like it, it does, you know, the county that I um, grew up in voted for Hillary Clinton. You know what I mean? And yeah. I just feel like that is different. Like that would not have happened, you know, 15 years ago when, you know, 15 or 20 or 30 years ago when I was born. So it's exciting just to use this story as a way to think about those things in Alabama culturally that we hold on to and that we prize, yeah. but things that we might also have to let go in order to heal and move forward. Yeah, that's, that's actually a very powerful message and a message that really Alabama and beyond needs to hear. So I'm excited about that. Um, I'll ex be excited to see what happens when it's a full-fledged opera. Um, yes. <laughs> I'm excited to go see it when it's performed. <laughs> yes, I feel like, you know, I'm so, I'm excited, like, I'm excited to see what happens when I like put the full performance up by myself and yeah. sort of have this kind of crazy, you know, hour and a half, like me singing through this role, like this very exhausting yeah. um, procedure and then process and performance. And then, you know, and then to be able to release it yeah. and then give it to other people to realize it's going to be exciting too. Well, I will just yeah. say that um, anybody who doesn't have a music background, the fact that you have a five octave range is extremely impressive. Um, <laughs> Thank you so much. I, very impressive. Um, I was an alto. Uh, I was in choir growing up, and I was, I'm very much an alto, and that's pretty much where I stay. <laughs> yes. um, <laughs> so that's extremely impressive. You probably will can and will go higher in notes than I ever could. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, it's so crazy. Like, you know, and it's also just a fun project for me because I miss singing. I used to sing every single day, mm -hmm. even if it wasn't for something, just you know, sing. And I don't have a studio right now. Even when I was painting, singing yeah. was such a is such a big part of how I paint, how I make anything. And so it's nice to just have a very specific, like very specific vehicle mm -hmm. for that. Cause you know, singing, releasing just feels it's, good. It's therapeutic. Even when you're, you know, making a fool, driving in your car, singing at the top of your lungs, <laughs> exactly. you know, it's therapeutic. Um, and art and all aspects are therapeutic. Um, so you, I think you talked a little bit about how you became interested in opera, but at a young age to be interested in opera is is kind of rare. It's It's definitely, it's such a, a sophisticated and complicated type of performance. What really drew you to that? Yeah, that's a really great question. I don't even know. I When I was a kid in Alabama, I definitely never saw an opera. I think the first yeah. opera I saw live happened when I moved to New York. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I was probably 22, 23. And like went on a date with someone who was trying to impress me and <laughs> took me to the opera. <laughs> took me to the Met and we sat in the orchestra and I was just like, wow, like That's amazing. That point, had, it was amazing. But at that point I had produced opera, like I had done student work, but I'd yeah. never seen like a full, full show. Yeah. But as a kid, I was just so because it, it used to be the Columbus Symphony, which is like the local symphony in Columbus, Georgia, where I went to high school. And they always had like free stuff in the summertime that you can go and see a full piece symphony. And they, we were playing classic, you know, major music mm -hmm. and they were playing it pretty well, you know. And, yeah. you know, it was just very inspiring. Mm -hmm. And then there used to be this channel at home called the Ovation Station, which showed like classical music. It showed classical concerts and showed ballet performances and showed opera performances it showed just sort of like contemporary dance, modern dance on TV. That's and amazing. I would just sit in my house and just like, like go to the symphony, sit in my house and come back and just watch as much stuff as I could on this TV channel. And this is really pre-internet, you know what I mean? This yeah. is really yeah. before you could like go on YouTube and watch something. Yeah. Um, and so that was really, that is, that is really how I got into it. That's and amazing. then I went to high school and this woman, Miss um, McFarland, she, Alice K. McFarland, she, she saw me sing in a talent show with my brother and a couple of other guys. And she was like, oh, like you need to come to my office. Let's talk about 
like joined this vocal competition. Like, I don't know if you sing classically, which I definitely didn't at the time. <laughs> she was like, I know that you don't speak Italian, which I definitely didn't at the time. And so, you know, it was just this way this teacher took a chance with me, mm-hmm. saw, you know, saw that I could sing, saw that I cared a lot and mm-hmm. really wanted to help me find my voice. And, you know, that was probably my freshman year or freshman year of high school. We and all so need then, teachers like that in our lives that can really, you know, see something within us and spark that flame and help us figure out how to, how to get there and achieve these goals. And it's amazing to have teachers like that. I mean, that's like why teachers are important, you know? And if I'm like, with COVID happening and all these teachers being like, I'm not going back into the classroom. Like, no, teachers don't need to go back into the classroom. Like teachers already do so much oh, work yeah. for students, for mm-hmm. families. Like they also don't have to be risking their lives. You know what I mean? <laughs> like we, <laughs> we just appreciate them so much. So I, yeah, I agree. I just feel so lucky. Like educators really can make or break a, a child's future. Honestly, and they really can, and they really can. And so, um, we're looking at one of your um, fashion designs. Can you just talk a little bit more about how fashion plays a role in your overall practice? Yeah. So I think um, I think a lot about fashion as as sculpture, mm-hmm. um, as objects that have a gestalt that take up space. That when you walk around it, it might change. Mm-hmm. That has some kind of transformation. And fabric is just really like the easiest way to sculpt something I think Mm because it's so inexpensive usually it's so flexible you can do so much with it I can drape it I can like apply it to something I can hang it you know I can fold it I can do all this stuff with it and so that's why I love it and and Mm -hmm. I love it as a material that allows me to like a material that I can hold in my hand Mm -hmm. paint is not like that you know paint is something that you have to have oftentimes some kind of matrix or some kind of tool that allows you to translate the mark, translate the material, you'll push the material around. Mm-hmm. And sewing is like me and my hand yeah. can manipulate this object and then I can see it, you know? And yeah. I love that. It's like instantly gratifying. And that's, I mean, and that's, and that's why I love it. It's something that you can see and you can change and you can, you know, deal with in space. Mm-hmm. And these I are, with the, I, I love this blue that you've had that with the photos that you sent me. This color blue is, is so beautiful. And this piece almost feels more like a sculpture than it does a, mm-hmm. a, a fashion garment. And so yes. I see the point you're making in terms of you looking at it as a, a, as a sculpture. Yes. Um, and like the blue also becomes really important. I'm glad you brought that up. Because in the opera, so many of the costumes are for the opera. Mm-hmm. And in the opera, um, paint blue becomes a really important color. Mm-hmm. So, you know, in the South, um, when you go on verandas, they have the, ver- the ceilings of verandas are painted like sky blue. Yeah. It's painted like the color of the sky. So that's yeah. paint blue. So paint blue was actually a color that was made with crushed, um, out of crushed indigo leaves. And so it was put on verandas in the South as a way to keep spirits from coming into your house. So when they look when they try to cross your threshold, they look up, see the ceiling, think it's the sky and cross over. Oh, so in this world, this that. blue becomes, yes, this blue becomes a very mythical color. Mm-hmm. So when the matriarch dies, everyone in the village, their, their, their clothes turn the color of paint blue in a way to think about the grandmother crossing over and flying over off into the new world. And so that's kind of, it becomes like this very spiritual, um, it's very spiritual color in this in this play and very significant. That's a very, it's like a morning color. It just shows how you're so connected to the story, but also as an artist, you think about these things. You are multidisciplined in figuring out how you want this story to be told either visually, verbally, or just with the symbolic, um, the symbolism within everything. And so exactly. that, that's, that's, that's amazing. Um, So we're going to go into your next series of works. Um, We have several examples that I'll just kind of go through as we're talking. Um, So the method of making these works, so oil on cement, which is a way of making a fresco. Um, And fresco painting is very historical. It goes back way back in time (laughs) in art history. Can you discuss how you came to use this type of material and this method of making your works? Totally. So I... So my father's a carpenter, carpenter, um, and I grew up 
you know, on the job sites, mm-hmm. <clears throat> hammering and, you know, <laughs> using cement and just like doing, doing whatever my father asked me to do. Yeah. And so when I came to school, um, part of the reason why I came to RISD is that I wanted to push the materials I was using because I was working in my apartment in Brooklyn for five years. Yeah. So that was very limited. Like I was only using plaster. I couldn't really, you know, use industrial materials. I couldn't weld. I couldn't. And it was really important for me to like push my materials. So mm-hmm. when I was um, my first semester here, I was in a sculpture class called retooling and my teacher and I were doing lots of experiments with very various materials and cement was one of the things that he really liked using. Mm-hmm. And I was like, I wonder, can I screen print an image on the cement while it's wet? Mm-hmm. Cause I was like, you know, I was really inspired by obviously frescoes, but in cave paintings, mm-hmm. um, but also how, how we can leave a mark in something that doesn't feel like it should have a mark in it. Yeah. So I did this first experiment where I got a screen, a silk screen and laid my cement out. It dries in one hour. So I had one hour to get my cement, my image into the cement, got the image into the cement, pulled it, pulled my screen print off and looked at it. It dried and it looked perfect. And I was just like, wow, like, whoa, I think we figured something out. You know what I mean? <laughs> and so then like two years later, it really did, it really started to, it really evolved. Mm-hmm. Um, when I when people used to come into my studio, I used to ask them to close their eyes and imagine a black person in an environment. Mm-hmm. So they would close their eyes, and they would open their eyes, and I was like, "Okay, where did you see a black person?" And mm-hmm. they were like, "Oh, I saw someone like walking down the street. I saw a black person hanging out in front of a bodega. I saw them playing basketball." Someone literally said, "I saw black people in prison." But everything that the everything that was said about where black people are seen in their imagination were in urban spaces defined by cement. And so I was like, wow, like, I feel like I can use that. Because why I was like, why are Black bodies being stuck in this very specific place? And how do I change that? How do I allow people to imagine Black people not in urban environments? You know, when you imagine Black people in an urban space, like, what do you think about? Lack of land ownership, Mm -hmm. poor education, high surveillance by police, lack of leisure, the perpetual worker. And I wanted to break all of those stereotypes because we know that Black people experience leisure. We yeah. know that Black people are not perpetual workers. We know that we we know that Black people are not a monolith. But how do we start to break that in the actual form? So then the image of Black people in kind of pastoral landscapes juxtaposed to the cement gives you that kind of tension. It shows you like it keeps you thinking about like wait, this is on cement, like why? Like why are these black people stuck in this kind of cement space, mm-hmm. but trying to perpetuate images that give you leisure, that give you sense of like land ownership, that think about like community building without high surveillance from police. You know, it becomes really important. And then like, and I, and I was thinking about that in terms of now even COVID and like, you know, in New York City, where I spent so much of my time in parks. Yeah. Black people in Washington Square Park, um, well, in, there's a park in, in Manhattan called Washington Square Park, mm-hmm. and white folks were out there in COVID, police were handing them masks, it was really chill, like they were actually there to serve, like everyone was outside, so it's actually fine, you know what I mean? No problems. But Black people in Brooklyn were being harassed by the police for being outside, for not having masks on, mm-hmm. for just doing the same thing that everyone else was doing. And I'm like, why, is it, why does our society work so hard to control Black bodies, Black people, when they're outside? Why can't Black people live freely outside without having people try to control their actions? And so that really became the project. So the paintings happen when they're wet. I paint the, I put the oil paint in the painting while they're wet. And and as it dries, um, I basically try to get a clear oil ground in the surface and I keep painting on it. So the paintings happen pretty fast. Yeah. Um, And yeah, that's how they work. I mean, it's really interesting. So we're looking at the family key, um, yeah, family key in the family garden. And it's a really interesting, it's kind of loosely painted, almost impressionistic in a way. And you think about, um, you know, historical impressionist paintings of of people leisurely in a park, enjoying a picnic or sitting by a, a lake or so on and so forth. And you never really see um, anybody of color in these paintings, um, unless exactly. they're maybe a worker or something of that sort. And so I think it's very interesting. You're reinforcing several aspects or several different themes within this one painting, the idea of the black family, 
but also the idea of the 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 black family within a park scene in nature enjoying each other as a family unit and i think that that's a very important aspect because that's another thing that is very stereotypical is that the black family unit doesn't exist and that's not exactly. true yeah, um, <laughs> it's not true and so i think <laughs> that you are you're you're facing these very difficult themes within your work but also in a very um i don't know it's, it is confronting so i don't want to say it's non confrontational but in a way it is but it's also um it's very beautiful very beautifully done um you. <laughs> you're welcome I mean, you're I and mean, you're talking about it perfectly i mean with this painting in particular this one is actually literally based off um a manet painting of the monet family in the family garden the it was a manet is a manet painting of the monet family in the garden yeah and she's holding this big fan and like there's this little kid and so i was just like i can recreate that this mm -hmm. actually looks so much like alabama there's a chicken there you know what i mean <laughs> like we're hanging out outside we're underneath a tree like it, yeah very much so thank you yeah yeah and um so i'll go to this one and so um and you may have already touched this on a little bit, but in your artist statement, you discuss being influenced by, um, you know, your rural Southern upbringing. Can you discuss a little bit more about how the South has influenced your work and the types of things that you are discussing in the work in relation um, to the South? Yeah, so I think, I mean, um, this, this, you know, if you're, once you're a Southerner, you're always a Southerner. Yes. And I just feel like the yes. things I think about and prioritize and like my, the values that I carry with me are just so Southern. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and so even w and when I start thinking about if I'm going to romanticize a landscape, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? It's going to be a Southern landscape. Yeah. And so in, in this, um, in this particular painting, each flower is actually a specific flower from various regions in Alabama, sort mm -hmm. of like brought together and compiled into this um, into this one frame. I wish I had the names right off the top of my head of all the flowers, but I definitely do not. <laughs> but but I mean, I feel like that becomes really important. I think, you know, for me also like Southern art, my favorite Southern art really happened uh, with the kind of Southern grotesque macabre that we think about in literature. So Flannery O'Connor, um, oh, nah, of course I can't think of anyone's name. But another, like, there's so many famous literary artists that mm -hmm. depict this the South in these very kind of like mystical, magical, um, liminal worlds. Like anything can happen in the South. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? And I love that. I love that spiritually. I love that kind of like mythically. And I think the paintings hold that. They hold this kind of, this twilight, you know, this twilight liminal um, place for possibility. Mm -hmm. And I think that becomes really important too. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so I'm gonna just go through these so everybody can see them. And then, I and then this last one, so Warrior at Rest. And so one thing I want to point out for anybody who's watching this, that a lot of the figures in all these works are wearing your actual couture garment. Exactly. And exactly. So, um, so for this one, I wanted you to touch on a little bit about um, how these, why and how these figures are wearing the garments. And then also, do you see something like this work in particular as a self-portrait and the idea of the warrior at rest. I love this. So uh, this, um, this image is a really great image because it highlights so much about thematically about my process and about the opera that I'm working, but also the ways that I'm seeing the visual vocabulary for the painting. Mm -hmm. So the figure is at the figure is lying down on in, in the grass and like a meadow. Mm -hmm. um, they are wearing the garment, they're holding, they're also holding um, a hot comb. Um, and they are kind of surrounded by these precious pine cones that they're collected, the, the most precious one they're holding close to them. And it just really, it gets at sort of like this stewardship of the environment mm -hmm. and like how important that is to do these characters. So this is not, this is actually not a self-portrait. Okay. <laughs> um, this is my friend, but I mean, there are real people. This is my friend D. Um, these like I have like three muses. D's definitely one of them, <laughs> and, <laughs> and it's really amazing because for me the warrior 
he is the main character, mm -hmm. um, not only in this body of work, but also in the opera. Mm -hmm. They become, they're, they're the 14, 15 year old person that becomes the head of the family and has to, you know, is trying to shift um, the culture, you know? And so I really wanted to have an image of this person, like feeling safe to be by themselves mm -hmm. in this isolated environment because I think that tells you so much about the environment yeah. for a black person to feel like I can lay outside on this pillow. And this is like part of what, this is my life. Yeah. You know, I think that gives you a lot of information. Obviously I'm playing with um, violence and death um, yeah. as well as leisure. Mm -hmm. um, I think there is an inherent violence to this cement work mm -hmm. that I, um, with either the bisecting of the body or the ways that the material, that I'm sculpting the material and the surface yeah. of the material. And I think that becomes really important because I don't want these images, like you said earlier, they're not just beautiful images, right? Yeah. They actually are images that are meant to make you think about several different things at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's sort of, and, that, and that's the case with this. And you know, and I, and I love that the garment, you know, I love that I can include the garments in the work, because I was thinking like, yeah. you know, Kehinde Wiley, who is a, a really amazing artist, yeah. takes, spends a lot of time like, you know, painting black folks in, that he knows or doesn't know or gets mm -hmm. to model for him, but they're very specifically trying to give you like, you know, black urban, yeah. you know, um, person. Mm -hmm. person, a black person that lives in an urban environment and like, you know, has hats on, the kicks the throwback, but like, you know, whatever. And also and I think, a position of power and importance a lot of the time with his work. Exactly. So yeah. he's playing with he's playing with the kind of performance of the black figure that way. And I think I was like, well, I really am not that interested in drawings like painting sneakers. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? I really am not that interested in painting a t-shirt. Like I was just like, how can I elevate like what I'm seeing in my head and what I imagine mm -hmm. for my community? without giving anyone anything that they've seen before. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And so I was like, why don't I just put them in the clothes that I make, you know? And it just makes so much <laughs> sense. Because then it's like, I, you know, I, they're, the clothes are very specific. They mean a yeah. lot to me. Like exactly. the, the pleats mean something, the color means something, the clothes mean something, the silhouette means something. And so the, the character, the, the figure can then begin to hold all of that information. And then it becomes like really about me sharing my imagination versus yeah. me just trying to, you know, show, show things that I know that in a different context, you know what I mean? I'm trying to recreate the context yeah. and, and recreate the story behind it. Which I love about this piece, because you could really unpack this piece in several different ways. Um, you do have, you know, a black figure laying in the grass, but he is clothed. Sometimes when you see, you know, anybody that has been um, shot or something like that, if they're unclothed, they're sometimes laying there, but this man is a warrior. And so you have a warrior who's wearing these beautifully elegant clothes. He's not in like, you know, what you would think of as a warrior, you know, garment. Um, it's very elegant, but he's at rest. He's at peace within his environment. It's not about exposing the black body in a negative way it's about exposing that black body in a more elegant and more natural way that you would normally that you would see um with anybody in this kind of position and so there's different there's this one to me is so powerful in so many ways like i feel like we could probably talk an hour unpacking this work specifically <laughs> um, uh, um <laughs> and you know i don't know if my comments i hope that my comments um about this work ring true a little bit. I think that your work is important. I think that you're doing some really great work and I can't wait to see what you continue to do. Thank and you. Um, I really wanna thank you for your time today. I've enjoyed hearing from you and I know um, our Birmingham uh, viewers will enjoy hearing from you. This was great, thank you so much for having me. Yeah. And I feel like the comments that you made were spot on. I feel like with art, you know, with the pieces that I make, you know, I have an intention, but if the piece stopped only at my intention, yeah. I don't feel like, you know, what good is that? 
like I have I have great I have great ideas you know I like I like my ideas but that doesn't mean <laughs> they're the best <laughs> ideas or the only way to see something you know and I and I feel like I, that piece is actually hanging right now in 1969 in New York City and I mean the reaction to that piece is just like you're saying people really can see exactly what they need to see in that piece mm -hmm. and I think that's exciting because as an artist to have a frame that creates opportunity for people yeah. to engage with it, it's like our job. Yeah, that's know? exactly. And, you know, um, as an artist, you always have intent with your work and, and it is really about what the viewer brings to it. Even sometimes you, you just can't control what the viewer brings to it. But I think what you are doing, especially in that work is a positive intent and is an important intent um, and something that needs to be kind of said out loud. So I appreciate it. This is so great. Thank you so much. No, thank you. I have really enjoyed hearing from you.